We have a very historical event, Martha. I'm so glad that we were able to find you and you had some time for us to be part of this movie project on the history of Venetia, which involves Vallejo family in such a large way. Well, thank you. I'm so excited and honored that you asked me. And I'd like to welcome you to the family home. This was the final home and it was always called the Yankee House. Um, because it was after uh, the Americans were here that they built this Boston house, yet it still had Mexican and Spanish features with adobe in between the walls. It's a beautiful building, you know, as I walk around, once upon a time there were real men and women and children who made into the pages of the history in this place. Absolutely, and I think the ancestors and the spirits are with us today. Yeah, wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. It's, it's a nice day, a little overcast, but I think it's time to maybe turn some pages in history and ask you some questions regarding the role that General Vallejo played in the forming of California, state of California. This is, after all, one of the largest states of America. It was 31st state when it became part of the Union. Uh, but there is a lot of history that preceded the forming of the state and General Vallejo had a lot to do with it and again a descendant of General Vallejo's family is our best source of information so can you please tell us how larger than life General Vallejo established this area and made it possible for America to become part of this nation part of this state actually and then moved on to bigger and better things from California. Well, I'd love to, and I would hate to say this, but not all descendants are historians. I like to think of myself as an independent historian who has studied the family um, for the last 25, 30 years. And when I think about Francisca Benicia and the general, I always like to think of them in their own time. And I like to try to look at them from a perspective of their time and kind of look at who were their peers to give their story. The general wrote his cousin Carrillo in about 1858, I must write the history of my people lest we disappear and be forgotten. For people were writing the history of California but not the true history. Yeah. And the true history goes back to the 1500s when most of Northern uh, America two-thirds of it were under Spanish domain. From Peru to California, three to five million people were under the empire of Spain. And what was the status of Mexico at that time when Spain became, took over this whole area? There was no Mexico. There was a Mexico City. And then in about 1810, it began to the people in what was Nueva España began to feel that they wanted their own uh, separation from the mother Spain. And so it became then the sovereign country of Mexico. But until then, it was Nueva España, New Spain. New Spain, mm -hmm. yes. And that extended, in, in a sense, all the way from Europe to here, uh, across the ocean. Oh, absolutely. The Empire of Spain was one of the biggest naval and so, and the rules and regulations, how they built the presidios, they were Catholic. So it was a Catholic nation from Peru all the way up through Texas, um, Santa, and you know, those states and California. Yes. And it was all Spanish speaking, plus the Native American languages. Let's, let's talk about achievements of General Vallejo in taking this desolate piece of land that was here and setting the stage for the development and evolution of modern society. It, it, it has underpinning in the rule that was here through General Vallejo and the Spaniards who were here. Well, it actually started when um, Juan Batista de Anza brought 240 colonists 1,800 miles up to found San Francisco. And in that one day, the area went from hunter-gatherer to the industrial age, for they brought metal, they brought leather, they brought their way of living with them. And those are the ancestors of both um, 
Francisco Benicia, and the general. Uh -huh. And so both of those two were also born into military families. They lived in presidios, almost like if you went to a, a military Academy. life today. Yes. Yeah, or yeah. The, the bases. Uh -huh. And the general entered the military at a very young age, but he was very ambitious and he was also nurtured to come up through the ranks very quickly and also politically. He was being groomed to take a political life. So he learned all kinds of things uh, along with his friend Castro in Alvarado. They were exposed to the port in Monterey where they met people from outside. In the end, the general learned English, French, Italian, and he spoke six different languages. But he also learned the mathematics. He was very bright. Right. And, and when you went into the military, you learned the payroll, how to run, run, run a presidio, how and to so feed people yes and, and, ma and to take make care sure them, take yes. care of all that stuff yes so by the time he actually got up to sonoma after he had left san francisco he was 29 years old and he was in charge of everything and all the people down to monterey and so that was a pretty big um big responsibility. responsibility there were three forces uh that were active in this area obviously the interest of the native americans mm -hmm the immigrants coming from the east and then the mexican who were here who were already here who had set ranches and were responsible for a lot of land development well that when you mention the three they're very spread out mm -hmm. when he came up here and we mentioned the native americans the general had a very good relationship with the native americans of a certain group the Native Americans weren't sitting around just having a good time and the Spanish Mexicans came in and took over. They also had interfighting amongst themselves. So the general used the old Roman trick, divide and conquer. So the ones that he made treaties with, he was one of the first to make treaties with the different groups, fought the ones that still were, they were very fierce up here, the Satyomis. And so in order to make this safe, and follow his orders to colonize this, he had to then have campaigns against the Native Americans who were not as friendly as the ones who joined forces with him. Chief Solano actually had his own military group, um, over a hundred. The grandson of Paul Revere went out to watch his maneuvers. Hmm. The general and his son wrote down that native language, the first Native American language to be recorded of Northern California. And we still have that language, although the people now are gone. And so, but the Mexicans he tried to bring up to colonize, he gave land to so that, and assured them that they would be safe and that they would have a new dream, a new life. Yes. And then those that were coming over the mountains, yes. he was ordered to protect them from those people that came over the mountains because those people were a little different from the colonists who came before, who brought families, who became Catholic, who could own land and became citizens of Mexico. The ones that came over the mountains came from Missouri and Tennessee, were mountain men, and they didn't understand the Catholic religion or the Spanish speaking. And so, but this was the country, the sovereign country of Mexico. And so. We'll talk some more about this. <laughs>